Yeah. 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 We're going to look this morning at the book of Holy Men, and we're going to our study, uh, as we're continuing our, our lessons on minor figures in the New Testament, uh, we're focusing on Onesimus. So we'll be looking today at Onesimus, Holy Men, and Paul. I'm not really going to read much out of the book this morning. Let's start off with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for the day that you blessed us with, Lord. Thank you for the congregation here that comes together, Lord, with the sole purpose of worshiping you, Lord, and learning more from one another, learning more from your word. God, we thank you for the day that you blessed us with. We thank you for the sunshine, God. We thank you for all the rain that you give us. I um, pray that you will continue to go with us this morning, Lord, throughout this Sunday school and throughout the worship service. Help us, God, to put the things of this world um, aside for a little while, Lord, and focus on you. We have this in Christ's name. We're going to start off in Philemon, uh, the only chapter in Philemon, Philemon chapter 1. And it starts in the first verse, I believe, is where the book starts as well. Philemon chapter 1, starting with verses 1 through 3. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker. To Ephiah, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So he starts out with greetings to, or they start out calling him, and he was greeting to Philemon, to Philemon's wife, and then the congregation that meets at their house. So what we find out is that uh, Philemon and his wife host a congregation in their home. Uh, I think we've talked a little bit before. We don't really understand what that's like here in this country. Um, but that's a really big deal to have somebody in your home. Uh, at this time, I don't know if it was daily, weekly, twice a week, um, but they opened up their home to other believers to come in and worship and learn more about God. So this is who um, Paul is writing to, Philemon. Um, it's basically probably a preacher. We don't know that for sure, but probably a preacher. Um, he's opened his home up. He's trying to share the gospel. And then moving on in verses 4 through 7. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. And so what we don't see here is it, it changes in starting in verse 4 from greetings to the church, the plural greeting, to where they're now speaking directly to uh, Philemon. So the you, the directive of you, um, starting in verse 4, ending in verse 22, is a singular, whereas in verses 1 through 3, it's a plural you. So beginning, he's greeting the church, he's greeting multiple people, and then he moves on directly and speaks to Philemon. Um, we also see the section of Thanksgiving and prayer, um, which is very common in some of Paul's letters. He often starts off or somewhere at the end, somewhere in the middle even sometimes, has uh, words of Thanksgiving and prayer to who's Writing to. Corey, in my uh, book, I have some notes at the top that I want to do. I got it from Mimes' Christian Prudence, Discretion, Politeness, Act, Generosity, Courtesy, and Intercession. Yeah, very good. So now we'll move on to verses 8 through 25, the rest of the chapter, the rest of the book, I believe. Therefore, although in Christ, I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do. Yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man and now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful to both you and me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I, was, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. But I did, I did not want to do anything without your consent, so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. 
Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother of the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done, any, done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me for your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one more thing, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with, be with your spirit. So from the book of Philemon, what we presume is that Onesimus, um, who was once a slave of Philemon, um, was a runaway slave. We think that at some point prior to this, he had run away, escaped from his master, um, and then somewhere after he, he escaped, um, he found Paul, or ran into Paul, and Paul began teaching him the gospel. Um, so as Paul writes to Philemon, the, the letter that we see, he decides, uh, rather than commanding Philemon to receive Onesimus, Onesimus, which through Jesus Paul had every authority to do, was to command him to receive him. Um, Paul decides to appeal, appeal to Philemon based on love. I think that's a really smart move on his part. Why do you think so? Because he owes him already so much. He owes him so Exactly what's written now. Did you read my notes? That was my next word, right here. Why? You catch more flies with honey than you do vinegar. Why is that? What does that mean? What's that saying even mean? Flies well, like honey, they don't like vinegar, right? So. If you want somebody to do something that you tell them to do, don't come be commanding in order to do something. Because in general, uh, as humans, we don't like being told what to do, right? Um, doesn't really matter what your age, your race, your religion, your shoe size, your eye color, whatever. None of us like being told what to do, unless it's from our wives. Occasionally, our wives just tell us what they want, right? Just tell us what to do. But other than that, most of the time, uh, we don't like being told what to do. Right. So he did. Yeah, he, he starts his letter off. He compliments, um, comes to him through, through uh, comes to him as a fellow worker in Christ, and then he goes through his request. So I think we see this throughout the New Testament: um, the fact that people don't like being told what to do. God gave the Israelites the law through Moses, and how well did they follow the law in the Old Testament? Not well. Over and over again, we see story after story of the Israelites falling away and coming back. All the way and come back. Um, people just don't like being told what to do. And so Paul decides, since he's writing directly to Philemon, he's writing a personal letter, but it's kind of different from some of the other letters he's written. He kind of takes a different approach. Um, in many of his other letters that are directed more at churches, he, he, hits, um, he addresses sin head on. He talks directly about sin, he talks uh, very specifically about sin, and he gives direction. Um, more authoritatively than he does here. However, in his personal letters, he's got a little bit of a different uh, touch to him. So Paul starts off um, telling Philemon that, first of all, Onesimus has changed. He's no longer the guy that escaped from you um, however long ago. He's no longer just a slave. He's now a brother of Christ. And so Paul offers up even that, um, you know, he makes the statement, although he was not, not useful to you before, you, know, you can take that a couple different ways. He wasn't a good slave or um, you know, other things, but he says he's now useful to both Paul and Philemon, who are trying to spread the gospel. And so why do you think that Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon instead of just keeping Onesimus and using him if Paul thought he was useful? Why didn't Paul just keep him and use him as a, a fellow worker in Christ? He wanted, he wanted Philemon's approval of this process. He wanted to be Philemon's idea instead of his own. Right. <clears throat> I think there was probably a, a sense that
what immediately came to mind for me was it was the right thing to do. Um, Paul was a man of integrity we see throughout the New Testament. And uh, it was just the right thing to do. Onesimus um, was a slave. He belonged to Philemon based off law and, and whatever else at the time. He didn't belong to Paul. Um, so any decision about his freedom, freedom uh, to Mike's point, needed to come from his owner. It needed to be a decision between Philemon and Onesimus, not Paul's decision that, hey, I'm just going to release your slave and I'm going to keep him here with me. And he's a brother in Christ now, so it's okay to do that. That's not the type of person that Paul does. So not only does Paul send Onesimus back, what does he tell Philemon in his letter about Onesimus? Yep. Any debts, any wrongdoing, anything that uh, Onesimus did, anything that Philemon would have charged Onesimus with, charges Paul's account. That's what he says. Charges my account. Um, he says, welcome him. Don't be mad at him. Recognize him now as a brother in Christ. Receive him as you would receive me. <coughs> this is again pleading on Paul's behalf. He's on the order. He's requesting that for him to do this. So, where did this idea of killing the uh, Philemon based on love rather than law come from? Where do we see that other places in the New Testament? If you look at Matthew chapter 22. <coughs> So this actually comes from the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. And actually, I'll back up and start with this. <coughs> Matthew 22, 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in law, tested him with his question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So we don't see Paul reference this quote from Jesus in his letter to Philemon, but we can assume that Philemon had probably heard this uh, quote before, the words of Jesus before, um, because he was, again, somebody who had a congregation coming to worship at his uh, house every week. But he also recognized that Philemon um, had been wronged by Onesimus. And so Paul's appealing to Philemon uh, to love Onesimus as a neighbor, to have compassion on him, treating him as he would treat Paul um, if Paul were there to visit him. And so for me, this is what the whole letter to Philemon is all about. I think it's a real life example of loving your neighbor as yourself. It's a real life example of mercy and forgiveness. According to the earthly laws and the so, uh, social norms of the time, Philemon had every right to punish Onesimus for running away. Paul's plea, though, to him was to look at this situation not through the eyes of the world, which were really good at doing, but to look through the eyes of love, according to God, according to the word of Jesus. Look at Onesimus as your brother, a fellow servant in Christ. Now, this actually was a lesson that I did a few months ago on Sunday night. But I lost my notes on that, so you don't have to hear the exact same lesson again. Um, but it's a lesson on loving others. Love God and love others. Uh, my favorite part of this passage in Matthew chapter 22 is verse 40. Verse 40 says, um, all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And uh, in, this, in this passage in Matthew, the Pharisee, the expert in the law, asked Jesus which is the greatest commandment. And what does Jesus do? He doesn't just tell them the greatest. He tells them the greatest two. Why do we think he does that? Why do we tack that second one on there? They're so connected, yeah. Uh, the second one is, is almost as important as the first. It's kind of the way I look at that. Um, and I think as Christians, we often forget about that second part. We like to focus on loving God, serving God, and then we sometimes even use that to neglect being good neighbors to those around us. Um, there are some extreme examples of this. I'm sure you've all seen um, Westboro Baptist Church on news occasionally. Um, I think I don't necessarily question their love for God. They're totally convinced that what they're doing is because they love God. Um, what they don't realize is they aren't focusing on Jesus' words that not just love God, love others. And so the way that they're coming out and they're treating other people um, is not the way that God would have. One of those, the, the first commandment is our faith. It's, it's for the spiritual side. 
cause the human thinking, and then the other one, love your neighbor, is where we are on the earth, and our human down here is we human beings. So I, I kind of look at it that way too. Yeah. That's a good point. I think we a lot of times we'll separate the two, right? We'll, we've got our, our spiritual lives, we've got our physical lives here on earth. Sometimes they don't connect. All of us have a good year. It's just Christian responsibility. It's like Christ gave us. It's hard to do sometimes, but we're supposed to do it. Extreme examples aside, I think we struggle with this every day um, as Christians at work, at home, on social media. Uh, I think we have opportunities every day to not only love God, but to show our love to our neighbors. Um, in Luke chapter 10, we see the example of the Good Samaritan. Jesus describes the man that's in need. Um, he's been physically beaten, um, abused, and he's passed by on two occasions. First, by a priest, and then by a Levite, before the Samaritan man comes along and has compassion on him. Helps him, takes him to a doctor, helps him get cleaned up. But going back to that passage in Matthew 22, love God, love your neighbor. Would anybody doubt that that priest that walked by loved God? No, I mean, he's a priest, right? You think, yeah, of course he loves God. Yet in this example, Jesus points out that just because you love God doesn't mean that you're doing it all right. Doesn't mean that you've got everything uh, under control. The priest didn't show love for his neighbor in that example in Luke chapter 10. And interesting, the Bible's pretty clear that it's not just, not just neighbors, not just neighbors. Enemies as well. You know, Christ points that out a lot. And that's probably one of the hardest things for us to do is love an enemy, someone who is actively against us. Um, and yet, when we start thinking about it, you know, Romans said that we were God's enemy, each of us. And God loves us, so if we're supposed to love the way God loves us as enemies, obviously, because we're all sinners. That's really the challenge we're talking about here is man, turning this over and loving somebody that is completely against us. Not, that goes against human nature. So we're, we're not supposed to be on this world. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. So there's got to be something unique about us. People look at us and go, well, man, you got to love your enemy. That's different. Okay. That's when they start to see that spiritual life can be a physical life. Uh, so I think we have opportunities every day to love our neighbors, love those around us, just like we love ourselves. But what gets in the way of those opportunities? Me. Right? Sorry, me. I get in the way. Um, we live in a society in this country that's all about me and what I want, and what my problems are, what my needs are. Um, I should get to do whatever I want. Um, so whether it's in the checkout line at Walmart, these are examples we use all the time when we talk about this, or the line at Taco Bell, which is, by the way, always at least 20 minutes away from Sunday night. So but I wait on it every Sunday. Um, or if we're at the ball fields um, at ball games, we come across people every day. Um, just as this letter to Philemon is a real life example of loving your neighbor as yourself, I think we have those opportunities before us every day, everywhere that we go. Um, it's not always somebody that's been beaten or robbed like we see in Luke chapter 10, but we do run across people every day that have struggles. Um, so if we don't come up to them, we don't talk to them, if we don't show genuine love or concern for them. Um, I don't know that we're really doing our duty as Christians. We're not doing what Christ said as followers of Christ to help those people. Um, that person checking you out at Walmart, um, they've been there all day. This is what they're doing all day. They're checking out people like you. They're probably not happy about um, having to wait in line and um, maybe the person's slow and people don't talk to them that often. So go out of your way. Be friendly. Make conversation. Um, whether it's about Christ or not, just be bringing it. Show love for your neighbors and uh, everything that we do. Be that person that makes their day a little bit brighter. Uh, so Michael is mentioning in Romans, uh, turn over to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 describes love in action. Romans 12, 9 through 31. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Clean to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. 
Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share, God, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful uh, to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heat burning coals on his head. Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so this is an example we see uh, love in action. We see this description of what it means to love one another. And again, these are all things that kind of go against our human nature. These are things that are really hard for us to do uh, as we sit down and really think through how we live our lives. And the last uh, example we'll look at is in Ephesians chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 5, we get more examples of what it means to love others. Um, this letter to the Ephesians. So starting with Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And so then he goes on and he starts giving some examples. Um, and we're going to skip down a few verses, starting at home. The first example that he gives here, talking about walking the way of love, walking the life of love. Um, he starts at home. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. It's actually a general statement. It just says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so that's, submit to one another, um, love your neighbor, you know, respect one another out of reverence for Christ. And then he moves on talking about the home. So it says, wives, submit to your husbands at the Lord. Um, for the husband is head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. So um, keep in mind, this is a section uh, that's talking about love in action. It's a section that's talking about walking this life of love. This isn't um, just like the letter to Philemon. It wasn't a letter demanding that this is what you do. This is a, a letter talking about what does it mean to be walking in the way of love? And so then we move on down to verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy, cleansing her by washing her with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without strain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands also love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this is a man who will leave sorry. For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So first thing, guys, that we, that we notice here is we've got three verses directed to women and nine verses directed to husbands. Uh, so be careful as you go back to that, that uh, scripture if you want to go show your wife that scripture. Uh, but if we're followers of Christ, we're expected to love our wives, husbands, as Christ loved the church. Christ gave his life for the church. Um, he put the church before his own life. That's the kind of love that we're expected to show for our lives. And again, that's just the example of home, at home. Um, we read on, we see examples of um, love, children, respect your mother and father. We see fathers, no one's for children. And then we see um, 
instructions for slaves and slave owners. I've got the, the numbers written down there, but um, oh, it's Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eyes on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your, from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not him, because you know the Lord will, will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is a slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism in him. And so this uh, passage here is specific to slaves and masters, um, something that was common at the time, but what we really need to keep in mind is the, the larger context of the passage that we're reading. What we started out in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, talking about is this is a passage that um, is talking about love. So remember the message Paul is trying to get across. Whatever your role, whatever your position, um, whatever aspect of life you're in, whoever you come in contact with, love them as you love yourself, or even more. That's the message of this, these scriptures that Paul's writing here. Um, Jesus, our Savior, came to this earth not to be served, but to serve. Um, there's no one that ever, has ever or ever will walk this earth that is greater than Jesus. We know that. Um, nobody's above him. And if the Savior of the world was humble enough to come and serve others, what makes us think that we are any different, that we would be too good to serve anybody uh, and to love our, our neighbor? So it doesn't matter what your role is, um, whether it's your job, whether it's at home, it doesn't matter what your income is, it doesn't matter what your race is, your gender is, there's nothing that makes us too good to love and serve others. And that's the example that we're looking at today. So that's the message I think that Paul had for Philemon regarding uh, Onesimus. It was a message of love and compassion for others. The message um, was directed at Philemon, but what we don't see is Paul's pleading with Onesimus. You can assume that there were previous conversations that happened between Paul and Onesimus to convince him to go back to Philemon. That's probably not something that Onesimus just automatically did. Um, we see based on the words of Paul that Paul sent him back to Philemon. Paul sent him back so that they could be reunited, as John was saying earlier. Um, so I want to end just with John chapter 13, 35 um, to sum up a passage of love your neighbor as yourself. John 13, 35 says, By this, everyone will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Anyone have anything else before we close? Any other comments? Thoughts? Mike, would you could close this in order? Thank you. Almighty God, thank you so much for a beautiful day. We're so thankful for the opportunity to come together with our brothers and sisters of Christ and learn more of your will for us. Help us to meditate, study, apply the things that we learn from your word to our lives. And not just on Sundays when we meet together with the saints, but every day as we're out uh, in the world. Help us to truly show the love. Son Jesus Christ show for us that you have for us and in our daily daily walks when everyone we come to <coughs>